Kevin Show. Tonight, Dick's guests are Jimmy Dean, Wally Cox, author Anthony Burgess, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cabot. Your applause warms the cockles of me art. If there's anything worse than chili cockles, I don't know what it is. But it's... <laughs> Say, do you want to uh, hear uh, the answers to what you wrote? <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, I'll just do some of these very fast. Uh, are, are you planning to have Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones on your show? What are your favorite hobbies? Are you planning to make any movies? What kind of records do you <laughs> like? This is from, from one of my greatest fans from Brooklyn. If you're one of my fans, you'd know something about me. <laughs> I don't need... Oh, I'm in a bad mood tonight. Probably be nasty throughout the entire show. Why does this studio look so much bigger on TV? People frequently ask that. It doesn't, actually. It's that I'm so much bigger that I make it look uh, smaller by comparison. Are you the shortest performer on television? <laughs> Third card, I get into that. I'm sick of short jokes. And it is also not true that I am the Pillsbury Doughboy either. I mean, so knock it off. What does it learn to, what does it learn? What does it take to learn how to be one of your pages? About 30 seconds, uh, actually a really applied effort. Dear Dick, if you meet me after the show, you can have a spaghetti dinner on me. <laughs> I, I'm gonna let that go. Um, I think we can all think of an answer to that. Dear Dick, I'm thinking of changing from mine, minis to hot pants. What do you think, Sharon Borella? Are you thinking of changing right now? I mean, <laughs> if so, where are you sitting? Dear Dick, you are my favorite. Every night I sit at home and watch you in my underwear. That's another one with it. <laughs> what I would be doing it. I, I shot an elephant in my pajamas, oh, right? I got my pajamas, I'll never know. That's right. Scratch your marks blind. Uh, where, what, uh, did I do this one? Is this about underwear? No. Where do you stand on dog owners cleaning up after their pets? Where, where do you stand is the question. There's no, uh, I don't know the answer. When are Bobby and the band going to get to do another number? That same handwriting again. <laughs> we don't know. You see, we don't plan our show into 1974 for some time yet, so. You yeah, chickened out, eh? Nothing on the card. Did you know? That during the warm-up, Rosengarten tells the audience we have to laugh and applaud. <laughs> what, what went wrong? Um, do, do you actually? No, you wouldn't do a thing like that. We can't force people to do anything. Would you please ask my wife to come home? I would, but my landlord frowns on it. And uh, he wouldn't. Oh, to you. Oh, I see. Gee. Where do the boys who take the tickets come from? Is all that, why do you care? Actually, an Arab slave ship docks about once a month over in the river, and uh, some of those boys, if they could tell their stories. Where can a single girl go in New York that's really groovy? A record factory. <laughs> Gee, that's funny. I, I did that same answer once for one of the best looking audiences we ever had in here, and they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I am now sitting in the balcony. While I should be home studying for an exam, what do you suggest I do? Uh, worry, I guess. I feel bad about that. What, what's, what's the subject of the exam? Perhaps I can help you. Oh. I had to ask. I come out here, I do this, she gets a hand for it. 
cheap answer like that. Why do you find it so difficult to accept compliments? I think it's lack of practice. I don't know why. I do. I, on the air, I, people compliment me. I, I come all over strange. I blush. I, I, I usually say something nasty to them. Uh, I don't know what it is. I honestly don't know. Dear Mr. Cabot, did you ever really louse up your monologue? Oh, a new visitor to our country. <laughs> <laughs> ah, very nice. Why, why do you always wear jackets? Don't you ever just wear a pair of jeans? Well, I, I did once, but, but Jean objected. Uh, oh. <laughs> wow, wow! <laughs> That's an old trick. If you don't get a laugh, do a funny sound. Buddy Hackett taught me that. You look remarkably like my husband. The resemblance is uncanny. I didn't see Joanne Woodward come in. <laughs> well, huh? Now, I'm killing time here, because all the guests are drunk backstage. <laughs> Mr. Cabot, you have a very good vocabulary, beautiful diction. Do you have a master's degree, and if so, from which university? No, I ain't. <laughs> Is a balcony seat your idea of the right place to stick a tremendous fan? <laughs> <laughs> tremendous fan or tremendous fanny? Which are you, uh... I'm sorry, I, I'm really, it's late in the week, I fall apart. Dick, Dicky Bird. Oh. <laughs> Who do you think you are, you conceited little... <laughs> You've walked by my apartment several times. You walked by the other night. Why didn't you come in, Elaine? I hate standing in line, Elaine. <laughs> Is that good? Funny? Oh, stop on that? Oh, I'm terribly... Oh, no, I don't know what's gotten into me. Listen, uh, Jimmy Dean is here, Wally Cox and, and Anthony Burgess, and uh, we have, um, uh, did that light mean to go on or not? Oh, no, so we go off on an anticlimax. All right, we'll be right back after this message. Waha! I'll be, don't worry. Ah. What is that? You remember me, I'm the guy who was here earlier. Listen, oh, somebody sent me a funny thing, and high time. <laughs> this is a photograph that appeared in a paper in New Jersey. Let me read you the caption. Jane Russell poses with her leading man, Jim Hawthorne, in current stage mystery comedy at the Meadowbrook Summer Theater, Supper Theater, sorry, Cedar Grove. Um, the play will run through April 4th. And look at Jane Russell and her leading man, Jim Hawthorne. That's one of the best looking guys I've ever seen. <laughs> how, do, how do you figure that? You know what's funny? That's me. This, this, this one, right here. Now, when Jane Russell was here, she, um, uh, that picture was taken, and I don't know how they did that, but the lady who sent it to me said the guy looked remarkably like me, although uh, not enough. Isn't that strange? Not hilarious, but certainly strange. <laughs> My next guest was here last week, and uh, because of a time problem, we didn't have a great deal of time to talk. Um, his book, The Clockwork Orange, which Ryan O'Neill mentioned the night before, uh, is a great favorite among the young and uh, presumably the old, too. Uh, we, we, anyway, he's written a lot of other things. His new book, MF, is out, and um, made the mistake of getting into what the title was about last time. And, uh, but he also has written a book about Shakespeare, which is, uh, even if you're bored silly with the subject of Shakespeare, you would love the book. It's remarkable, and he's a remarkable man and writer, Mr. Anthony Burgess, right here. Long name to intro, but... Yeah. How are you again? It's uh, Well, been, been, well. You are? Well, yes, I think yeah. yes. You always get me at the end of a week. If I seem a little punchy, it's all right, because at the end of a week of this kind of work, you're... Your mind begins to go. I yes, well, it's, the, it's the end of my week, too, you know. That's right. Yeah. Why should I think I'm the only uh, one whose week is ending? I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. When you were here uh, last time, we talked a little about um, uh, Princeton, where you teach now. Yes, indeed. Yes, we did. Yes. Do you live right on the campus? I live the... by the football stadium. They have a sort of game there where men come out wearing kind of Martian armor. And they, uh, they play a kind of rugby football, but they play it the wrong way around. This is American football, I take it. That, oh, yes, that is American football. I see. It's very different from your own. Well, they have bands playing, and uh, I think they possibly have drum majorettes, or this is Prince, and they may not, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm right by the camp, by the, uh, by the stadium, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of house do you have? 
I have a house that belongs uh, to a Chinese professor of electrical engineering who's taking a sabbatical in Taiwan. Yeah. He's a professor of electrical engineering with his grandmother, grandfather, and three or four children, and all their books are there and all their clothes, and we're just camping out. Yeah. I know he's a professor of electrical engineering because all the wiring is wrong. He knows exactly how far to let the wiring go uh, before uh -huh. collapse occurs. And my small son was very nearly electrocuted the other day when putting a lamp on. It's an exciting house. It must be. I mean, but all those Chinese books uh, and all... Uh, all all yeah. the Chinese books there, and a lot of chopsticks, but nothing to eat steak with. <laughs> <laughs> what... Uh, do you deal with the students directly uh, these days? Uh, when I was in school, you didn't always have a great deal of contact with the professors that you wanted to. Do they, can they come to you and ask you anything they want and bring their problems Well, well they can. They can come. But I'm, I'm ashamed of asking them in. I mean, there are no carpets on the floor and, uh, you know, nowhere to hang coats. Uh, there's plenty of whiskey and that sort of thing, but uh, nothing to drink it out of. Uh, I'm ashamed, so I usually meet them in a pub. But the pubs, in the pub, they say they're too young, and so we end up by meeting in the street and risk arrest. By doing yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. well, uh, do you deal with parents too? Uh, as I a, occasionally have, I occasionally have parents who come from Detroit and other mm -hmm. towns, saying, you know, I've been in the timber business for a long time, and my father was in the timber business. And my son wants to be a poet. Please stop him wanting to be a poet. And I say, you know, whether he's going to be a good poet or not is not the point. I'm here to try and persuade him to be a poet. So don't come to me. How do they take that? Well, they, uh, they say, as a rule, that uh, poets are a danger to the American community. Poets are anti-establishment. Uh, poets are anti-Nixon and anti-Agnew, despite Agnew's immense vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And uh, they feel that uh, to be a poet is to be a sort of commie, I think is the term. And this is what they're scared of. Any free use of words, any use of words creatively in a free zone, as opposed to the kind of set groups of words we get on television commercials mm -hmm. or in political speeches, is dangerous. Free use of language is dangerous to a particular generation. And that's one aspect of the generation gap. The kids want to use words freely, want to invent, want to be poets, and the parents don't want this. And were they offended when you said, I will not discourage this boy from being a poet? Um, Vaguely offended, and, yes. But yeah. after all, they're paying the fees, so they shouldn't be offended. Yeah, I see. Mm. You know, could we do something here yeah. I wanted to get to last time? Mm. There is a rumor that you can speak. Elizabethan English and, and oh, yes. the Indeed, way it sounded, they oh, yes. say we never get to hear that and it's oh, yes. very rare to yeah. get a guest who can do yeah. that. Um, do you mean speak as Shakespeare spoke? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you oh, can yeah, actually do, do it oh, if you yes. want to oh, suddenly yes. start the conversation. Oh, yes, do that. It. Yeah, yes. It's amazing. Uh, the fact is that, um, you know, Shakespeare was born more than 400 years ago and there were no gramophone records then, mm -hmm. but we have a very accurate idea of the way they spoke How? in those days. Well, it's a long story, but um, if you take a word like mouse, M-O-U-S-E, we do know that the Anglo-Saxons pronounced that word moose because of the way they, sp they spelt it, M-U-S. And in Scotland, mm -hmm. they still say moose and hoos and so moose. on. Uh, when the Normans came over in 1066, they changed the spelling of the word to M-O-U-S-E, which is a very French spelling, like stor strawberry moose. Mm -hmm. The word was moose a hundred, a thousand years ago, and it's now mouse. So it has changed. Yeah. So it's changed gradually, and uh, if you tap in at about the year 1550, you can guess pretty accurately that it's probably something like moose, which is not far from Dublin English. Yeah. And on the whole, you can say that um, the best person to speak Shakespeare, as he used to be spoken in his own day, would be a Third Avenue bartender, a combination of New York yeah. and Irish. Why is that? Is it, it, uh, well, uh, the, America's is a very that... conservative country. The, mm -hmm. the language in, uh, in America has hardly changed since 1620, yeah. whereas in England it had a terrific change about the year uh, 1750. <laughs> Whooshed forward. It got rid of all its mm -hmm. R's, so instead of saying feature or or creature, we just say creature, feature. We got rid of the R in the middle of a word, at the end of a word. Why? Why does an R disappear from a language? Uh, it's a very weak R. Uh, yeah. It's so weak in English that many Americans imagine that we don't say Paris, we say Paris. Paris. We don't, of course, we say Paris. Yeah. Uh, the, the R is so weak, it becomes a murmur. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the murmur it turns into is the sound uh. Whereas you say feature in the old days, feature, it becomes okay. feature, uh, uh. The sound yeah. is a kind of substitute for an R. But the R it's, a long, it's a long story. The R has disappeared from parts of America and not other parts. In the South, it's very there, hard there, are to very few, there are very few R's in the South. That's right. But up here in the Northeast, the R is pretty strong. Now, anyway, why should that be? Yeah. I don't understand. No one ever completely explains to me why, and why it no, should be. Nobody, I... nobody understands why languages change. They seem to um, change totally outside the realm of human control. Mm -hmm. uh, we do know that about uh, the time when Henry V was fighting at Agincourt, the language began to change very rapidly. We had what was called Great Vowel Shift. And this word mouse that had been pronounced moose at that point mm -hmm. began to change to something like moose. It was working down to mouse, you see. Yeah. 
the tongue became uh, tired of holding the long ooh sound. It began to waver and wobble. And oh. instead of saying moose, it said moose. And it dropped down to ma and tried to get up again to oos. It didn't oh. quite make it. Where, where will it end? Well, uh, where it, is it, all it, going? Can't, it can't go any further. You see, ah is about the bottom of the mouth and ooh is the top of the mouth. That's right. And you can't do anything about that. But uh, it explains why we say moon. You see, moon obviously was, is spelt with two O's. Yes. M O O N. And that mm. was obviously pronounced moon. And when the oo words got out of the way, the o words got up there. Moon. <laughs> and a word like road, R O A D, roared, climbed up in the same way. Roared, road, road. This climbing goes on all the time. We don't know why, but it does. Well, civilization is sinking, the language is climbing. That's right. Maybe, no, well, way, Shakespeare, 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 but, a piece of Shakespeare. Huh? You want some Shakespeare? Would you? Yes, indeed. Well, but first, we must, uh, yeah, we'll unless you want to do so, uh, the Ovaltine label in, in Elizabethan uh, oh, uh, good, what a good idea. English. Do I get paid for this? Uh, you probably will if you do it right. Chocolate flavor, special dietary information. One serving of Ovaltine provides these percentages of minimum daily adult requirements as established by the U.S. government. Will do. That's fine. Ovaltine, the drink that is a food. Thank you. That's as Shakespeare, that's as Shakespeare would have done it. <laughs> We're going to bridge the generation gap. Tell you what to do with your magic decoding ring. Watch the mug of Ovaltine. Ovaltine. Ovaltine? Talking with Anthony Burgess, and, and uh, language, it just intrigues me. Um, mm. If I had no, nothing to do, I would study it uh, in all its forms, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's your but, medium, isn't it? It's your medium. My medium. It's your medium, yes. But, do, uh, sorry. Well, well, yeah. We were going to do uh, some actual Shakespeare for us, well, the way uh, that the people sitting yes. there in the pit used to hear it. Yes, indeed. Now, uh, let's take um, uh, Hamlet. I can't remember the whole soliloquy, you know, to be or not to be, but yeah. uh, you can be pretty sure, I kid you not, as they say, that uh, what they heard in 1601 AD in London was something like this To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a say of troubles and boy oppose and end them, to die, to sleep no more, and boy asleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Devoutly. Devoutly to be wished. That sounds like an Irishman from Nebraska. It is. It is. It is. It is that. It is. It really does. Well, it, see, sounds, the, it sounds the, flat at one, and, and yet it sounds Irish. Well, the way they speak in Dublin is the way they spoke mm. uh, when the uh, when the English were ruling Dublin in uh, you know the 1590s. The, the, yeah. the language hasn't changed since those days. Uh, when we talk about Irish speech, we don't mean the speech of Irishmen. We mean the speech of Englishmen in that period, which was yeah. transplanted to Dublin. So the say and a cup of tea is not Irish. It's uh, pure English. It is. Mm, it's pure and Elizabethan English. That's probably English. insulting to yeah. the English to be told that. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a fair signal. You see, when you see the le when you see the letters E A in a word, mm -hmm. S E A T E A, that was a signal to the people of Shakespeare's time that they pushed the tongue down a bit and said T. Yeah. Uh, you didn't say see the C. You said uh, see the C. You made a distinction between the two words, which we can no yeah. longer make. And a, a golf tea and a cup of tea. You see, we're different again. T and T. Yeah. Very useful. And so things that rhymed in Shakespeare don't rhyme now because certain exactly, words have changed. Exactly. Well, there's a, there's a good example in, uh, I'm sorry to be high, bro, in uh, Henry IV where um, uh, Falstaff and the Prince Henry are having a, a bit of an argument. And Prince Henry asks Falstaff for his reasons. What are your reasons? What are your reasons? And the Falstaff said, reasons are as plentiful as blackberries. But of course, what he said was raisins are as plentiful as blackberries. Oh, and you get so, a pun there. So it was a gag then. It's a gag. Now Raisins now are no as plentiful as blackberries. No joke now. So the actor has to do something funny with his foot or yeah, something exactly. to get a laugh. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's, exactly. That's, <laughs> the way, that's the way it is. Say, uh, last night I said something. Sir John Gilgood was here, speaking mm. of Shakespeare. And uh, I said a thing, and there was a breakup in the sound, and people thought it was censored out of the show. Mm. Maybe it should have been. Mm. But there was something wrong with the microphone or with something, and we had this weird thing. Mm. And Maybe you can tell me what the source of it is. It's, a, it's an anti-Irish remark uh. made in the 19th century. And something tells me it was, I don't know why. Uh. Well, maybe I'll, I'll just tell it to you. The, yeah. I think it was someone advised, uh, was advising another world ruler what to do about the Irish yeah. problem. Yeah. And, and the thing went, and this is where it started to break up last night. Um, he said the, the answer to the settlement of the Irish yeah. question would be to have the Irish and the Dutch change countries. Then the Dutch would cultivate the land in Ireland and feed the world, whereas mm. the Irish would neglect the dikes and drown themselves. Ah, and yeah, this would yeah, settle the Irish yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. And 
God, yes. I wonder who, who would say a thing like that? Well, you, so. can, you can work out who it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be Parnell, it wouldn't be Gladstone. Mm. Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be some Tory. Was it Buddy Hackett, Tory. possibly? I, I just don't... <laughs> a Tory. I don't think anybody dare say that now. Yeah. It was the kind of thing that was said. It's, it's a kind of Cromwellian remark. It's, it's a little... It's, it's pompous but witty, I guess, you might say. Yes, the Irish... The, I'm part Irish myself. Are you? Uh, I'm, I'm, I am, too. My, grand, my grandmother was a Finnegan, so I, I feel strongly for the Irish. My grandmother yeah. was from Tipperary. And uh, it's still there. The older I get, the more Irish I become. I'm told the more Irish I look. And uh, this is something I have to get used to. I feel more like an Irishman. I feel less and less like an Englishman as I get older. It's as though the deep buried blood is gradually rising to the surface. How do you uh, know if you're becoming more Irish? Because I'm well, quite I, I'm, Irish I'm, and I was I'm becoming, I... I'm becoming, in a curious way, anti-Southern English. I, I'm, a, I'm a northerner. And I don't yeah. think Americans appreciate that, uh, you know, we have our division in, in that very small island, just as you have the division here, or used to have the division. You had a civil war, indeed. Uh, so did we. But um, in the north, where I come from, in Lancashire, we feel closer to Ireland than we do to the south. Now, in the south, we have London. We have Eton and Harrow and Oxford and Cambridge. We have a special kind of sector of the entire population which rules the country, which provides the country with a way of speaking, because the way the Queen speaks is southeast English. And uh, the, government is, the government is carried on there. The big universities, the public schools are there. And we resent it. And, uh, one um, aspect of this resentment uh, occurred a few years ago when the Beatles appeared. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not uh, suggesting that the Beatles are great artists. They probably were. I don't know what's happened to them now. But uh, I remember when the Beatles appeared, I was asked by the editor of a New York magazine to write an article in which I presented the Beatles as the new four evangelists. I said I wouldn't go as far as that. But the Beatles did this. They did uh, show the world and show America particularly that there was another way of speaking English. Mm -hmm. And it's the way that I was brought up. Uh, you know, you speak like this, right, you know, like uh, Ringo Starr, yeah. right, like the Maharishi, the Maharishi you know, you know, he knows his onions, like, he, he's, he tell you to get, you know, to get, like, with the, with the, with the Atma and the Mahatma, you know, and, and like, just purge mm -hmm. off your fleshly, your, your fleshly uh, endowments and get in touch with the spirit. You know, th this is the way they speak in Lancashire, but if you try to get into a university in England or even in America and give a lecture on Shakespeare mm -hmm. and began uh, like this, you know, like, lads, today we're going to have a look at William Shakespeare, who was born in 1564 and died in 1616, and we're going to have a look at some of his plays, they'd laugh at you. Yes. Because the accent is no longer associated with scholarship, with learning, or with government. It's merely associated yeah. with comedy. Yeah. And this is something we in the north of England uh, feel very strongly about. Do they feel a need to popularize the plays to make kids read them? Because they can, you can suffer through Shakespeare. If you, to, uh, I expect a modern production where the, they'll give Juliet the pill instead of uh, the potion or yes. something in order to intrigue the the audience is to keep... It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what they do. I mean, Peter Brook's gone pretty far, God yeah. knows, in Midsummer Night's Dream here, but as long as they keep the language, that's yeah. all that matters. Because that language is, is, is what made us, you know, English and American alike. The language has been made by the, that, that particular man, that man with no education, that man with uh, uh, just a tremendous imagination who was prepared to invent words, use words in new ways, and build up a tremendous vocabulary that we're living off now. Yeah. Uh, Spiro Agnew, God knows whether you know Shakespeare or not, but he's living off Shakespeare as the rest of us are. He made the English language, and that's the biggest inheritance we've got. We can, when, when the moon probes, when the moon landings are forgotten, when uh, the Vietnam adventure is forgotten, when the principles of democracy are forgotten, the English language will remain. And it's ours. But who will be here? English speakers. I'll be right. We Probably, you know, oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, we still have a message. We'll be right back after that. See you then. <laughs> Talk with Anthony Burgess and Wally Cox will be joining us in a moment, but we only have a few minutes here. Uh, I was going to ask you something. You always talked. About, you said something that I think any writer would envy. You said that time passes so fast, and you have so many books you'd like to write yeah. that you know you're never yeah. going to have time yeah. to write. Yeah. Uh, how, have you ever had a mental block where you couldn't write? Though is no. that a temporary thing, or does it? Are you always got? No. Well, I, I started writing very late. You see, I, I spent a good number of years of my life trying to be a composer of music. I, family had been a musical family. My father had been a cinema pianist, you know, in the old days when they had, when had those the, newspapers. Uh, yeah. he, was, uh, he was fired from the job because he played uh, inappropriate music to a religious film. Uh, but what, for example? Uh, well, <laughs> he, he, it, was the, uh, it was the Last Supper, and he played for He's a Jolly Good Fellow. He, he's, uh, <laughs> he, 
Well, he, he used to be under the screen. He never saw the film before it was actually shown, and yeah. he used to improvise the music as he went along. And, uh, and he didn't know what was Well, he there? saw a table with people around it, and they were drinking, and he thought it was a kind of uh, stag reunion, and uh, <laughs> he played this. Anyway, the point is that I tried to be a composer for many years, you see, and it was only mm. when I was about 38, which is pretty old by today's standards, that I, I envied these people who merely just typed out one line and uh, that was prose or poetry, whereas when you're writing music, uh, mm -hmm. you had about 24 lines to the page, you know, flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, all the way down, and you had to fill all these in. And by the time you'd spent about six or seven hours on a single page, you'd produce about three seconds worth of music. And then yeah. you had to copy the parts out and uh, persuade a conductor to get his orchestra to play, and uh, you had, had one performance, and that was it. So uh, writing seemed a much easier task, and I began to write as a kind of hobby, and... Uh, then became a professional writer. If, uh, is there any reason why... So I, I started late, you see. And, yeah. uh, so there's, uh, you know, the, the things that I would have got rid of by the time I was 38, I still have in front of me. It's as simple as that. Things you'd have gotten rid of. Th things I would have written by yeah. the time I was 38 still have to be written. What do you think about a writer being a, going into psychoanalysis? Uh, I, think so, I, think I think it's shocking. I think it's a ghastly thing. The, the psychoanalysts yeah. will uh, take all the creative energy out. I have a student at Princeton who is uh, taking... Uh, analysis and he can't mm -hmm. write anything, he just sits there, uh, not bemused, zombified, and all this great creative guilt mm -hmm. is being sucked out of him once a week in New York. And he can't use this guilt. You see, um, writers have to be guilty. Uh, we've got to feel guilty about everything, and this guilt provides a dynamo, and this dynamo charges the creative act, so that every time you sit down and write a book, you're uh, shedding your guilt about people, about the world, or whatever it is. And if you, once you get rid of this guilt mm. and become a, a happy person, you're no longer an artist. What if the guy feels better, though? Would you, would you want to take away his comfort in order to re put back his writing talent? Uh, it's a kind of demon. Once, once mm. you start on this creative uh, kick, uh, you, you're landed with it. It's there all the time, and you're not happy unless you are writing. You're re wretched while you're writing. You're miserable as hell, but there's nothing else you can do. You can't read anybody else's work because uh, you think, well, I could have written it this way. Mm -hmm. You can't go to the movies or you think, well, I would have made it this way. You can't listen to music because words get in the way. And you just end up by being only happy, possibly, when you're making love, drinking or, or writing. And those things don't take your uh, creative urge away? Not quite in that order. Well, yes. <laughs> well, simul no, not simultaneous. They're, they're, they're on the same level. They're on the same level of pleasure and yeah. creativity. I see. Mm. I see. Right, I'm relieved yeah, to know yeah. that. We have a station break and we'll be right back. Someone asked, during the break, asked, uh, we had two questions. One of them, a lady down here asked, uh, if, you have a, if you call a mouse, if they call a mouse a moose, what do they call a mouse? If they call a mouse a moose, mm -hmm. you mean what do they call a moose? What do they call a moose? They call it a moose. Very the, you know, the, the, two, the two O's were pronounced as a long O. Oh. They call the moon, M W O N, hmm. moon. There you All are. right. Okay. Yes. Really. Yeah. Really. Who, who had another? Mm. Uh, the gentleman right next to a. Yes. <coughs> it's a bit slower and there's less smog. They got rid of the smog in London in the 1950s because uh, the Smithfield Cattle Show was held during a period of very bad smog and most of the prize exhibits uh, suffocated. And the uh, British are very fond of animals. Yeah. And so they brought in their... Uh, no, it is true. They brought in so their uh, smoke abatement law. So London is a fairly clear city. Uh, otherwise, there's uh, a little less mugging, rather less mugging. Yeah. Uh, you, get your, uh, you get your drugs free at midnight at a chemist shop, uh, a drugstore in Piccadilly Circus. If you're hooked and can't be unhooked, you, you get your drugs on the National uh, Health Service scheme. And uh, on the whole, it's a lot quieter. It's a big city, it's uh, fairly gay, but uh, the pace is rather slower in London than it is here. You mentioned last time that you moved here because you could work better here, whereas some people are moving to England because yes. they want the quiet. You like the excitement. There's, a, there's far less excitement in London than there is in New York, without any doubt. Uh, the excitement uh, resides mostly in the arts. It's mostly in uh, theatre, for instance. Uh, the young are as excitable and as interesting as they are in America. Indeed, they copy Americans a great, great deal of the time. But um, London's, a, London's a big vertical city, whereas this is a great, uh, a, big, well, a big horizontal city. This is a great perpendicular city. Uh, you have the sensation of space in London. 
And uh, there's a lot of public transport, which is a good thing, and the, um, the underground, the subway, is far better run than the New York subway. It's far cleaner and far safer. Uh, you can walk out at night, you can walk out at three or four in the morning, with a fair certainty of not getting mugged, or if you're a woman, of not getting raped, uh, which is something. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think you'd have to say that. You can walk out here, but the certainty is, yes, not, uh, yeah. the certainty is not there. Who, who else had a question? Ah, that's an interesting <laughs> well, question. My... Let me repeat that for uh, the home audience. You wrote a book called The Clockwork Orange, which had to do with violent gangs taking over. It's one of the, one of the most brutal books, in a way, you can read. Mm. Uh, and uh, some of the scenes in it are quite violent. Mm. Are they not? They are indeed. And yet, she was saying, how can you rectify that with, uh, just uh, how can yeah. you reconcile yeah. that with... Um, well, the, I, I wrote this book in uh, 1960, that's a hell of a long time ago now, when um, there was nothing like the violence in uh, New York or any other city. Uh, on the scale that we have it now, but um, uh, I wasn't thinking of London. I wasn't thinking of an English city at all. I was thinking of a purely imaginary city uh, which could be either in the Western Hemisphere or in uh, the Eastern. In effect, it could be uh, either America or, uh, or Russia. Uh, it was a composite city, and I had composite teenagers beating people up. It was not meant to be a photograph of life as it was lived in London. At the time when I wrote the book, we had a fair amount of violence, but it was done in a, kind of gent in a kind of gentlemanly way. We had the mods versus the rockers. It wasn't a question of the mods and the rockers combining to beat up the old. The mods and the rockers beat up each other, which was reasonable. And we had teddy boys who were fairly smart. They dressed a little like John Steed in The Avengers. And uh, they were too concerned with keeping their clothes clean to become involved in too much violence. It wasn't as violent then when I wrote the book as it is now, uh, as it is now here. There's violence everywhere, but rather less violence in London than there is in, uh, in America. And it's something to do with drugs, of course. Yeah, it is. Mm. Uh, do we have to... Uh, there's a lady with a... Yeah. Do you, do you accept the speech here for what it is, America, or do you find it just a bastardization of the proper English? No, this is... The good. question it, was, do you find uh, Americans a <coughs> bastard... Sorry. What was the question? Do you find... <laughs> bastardization? No. Do you find American speech a bastardization of, uh, of English speech? To put it nicely. No, this, this, is, this, is, this is good English speech. This, this has a, a, as much, any kind of American speech has as much claim to regard it as real English as the English the Queen of England speaks herself. And uh, incidentally, she speaks a, a dialect 100 years old. She's not uh, up to date at all in her English. American English is a little old fashioned in its sounds, remember, because the sounds are uh, uh, those spoken three or 400 years ago. But uh, American English is very creative, it's always making new forms, it's very, very quick to find a new term, a new phrase, a new slang um, phrase or idiom for um, a new phase of social change or a new invention. And this is what I admire about English. In, in, England, we, uh, in, America, in England, we tend to be a little conservative about inventing things. And when we want to take over a new word, we usually take it from America. And we're always a bit late in taking it. That is why we sound old-fashioned. We must take a pause. I, I should explain, by the way, that uh, Shirley, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm was going to be here tonight. Uh, was stuck on the floor of Congress. Um, <laughs> you see how language can break down. Due to a new shellac job, she's stuck on the floor. Uh, she's, she was held up there and couldn't be here. We'll be right back after this message with Wally Cox and Jimmy Dean. Stay with us. <laughs> well, my next guest is an interesting chap with a sort of strange sense of humor that it's almost impossible to try to describe. We have probably pulled him away from something extremely frenzied like flower watching or pebble polishing. Will you welcome please Mr. Wally Cox. My impression that 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the the loss of the R. Yeah. 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 I refer to it as a loss. You may think of it as still there. No, it's lost. It's lost. It's gone, yeah. Good. We have no argument then. Yeah. Yet, yet. Uh, it was due to the fact that that a number of English kings, starting, I believe, with George the Third, or. Thereabouts um, had a very thick German accent. Well, and they'd have a, a pretty good R then, wouldn't they? Really? 
Well, no, it's, it has not R uh, at all in chairman. Yes? I heard one. <laughs> oh, I don't know, no. Uh, yeah, but it says, it says, says no R uh, in German? Rassenstolz. Rassenstolz. How about Raus mit him? Raus. Oh. Yeah. Raus. Raus. Yeah. Raus. Yeah. Ra Raus. Also, oh. the broad A, I, I thought. That came, also, that came very late. It that, came, came, that came very late. Yeah. But it did come from. That was the no. King's English, was it not? No, 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 no. No, I, I, am, I have been spreading this no, false no. rumor for years no, among my true. friends, no. and it's no. now something of a tradition in America. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. I mean, no, it doesn't happen. No, no, no it doesn't happen. It'll spread. It'll. Yeah. It once happen. these things are, once these rumors are started, they cannot be stopped. Mm. You mean that you are responsible for the idea that the A is uh, not broad for the reasons we think it is, and you have caused this trouble in this country? I have, yes. I am. I have been the. I have been the willing dupe mm -hmm. of some somebody with that idea. I have no idea where it came from anymore. I like to think now that it came from me. <laughs> In fact, I'm forced to think that it came from me. Mm -hmm. That's much more likely. What have you done lately? Have you polished any pebbles? <laughs> you know, you, I mentioned that. I don't mean to pick on pebble polishing because it's actually quite an art and the pebbles that you have polished, it's hard to keep saying this, uh, polishing pebbles uh, are quite beautiful. And I would be the last person to uh, disparage yeah. anyone's um, hobby or art, yeah. such as pebble polishing is yours. And, and I, I do apologize for the fact that I referred to it sort of flippantly as if an odd person would polish pebbles. I didn't feel any pain at all. I, you didn't? No, I feel there's no cause for, for regret on your part. Or, you never bring uh, me pebbles anymore. <laughs> you don't bring me pebbles like you used to, I think is <laughs> the way that phrase goes. Probably. <laughs> it's, it's an old song, isn't it? <laughs> would you feel that if you were psychoanalyzed, it would hurt your work? Well, Having spent 13 of the last 20 years on various couches, it's hard to say that I have not been analyzed in any way. You've been on couches for 13 years? Yes, you're, you're, you're blanching, you're turning white. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed, for some reason I don't think of you as I know, a I person with it... any problems. Ah, yes. Well, this is, see, I'm, I'm this in This was a... your problem, <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm in a setting now where my problems show the least, or the most, or to the best advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, whereas, where do where would your problems show up? Uh, probably as soon as I leave, I, I go into a deep gloom, <laughs> and friends keep trying to cheer me up. How do they go about that? Well, starting with friends, his names begin with A. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A, A. I suppose that's an exaggeration. I don't think we're into fruitful ground here. No? I don't know how to, well, I don't know how to give a, a worthwhile answer to well, that. Well, we could go back just to the original thing, which was, does it affect your, your work in any way? Oh, uh, oh, yes. Do you feel less compulsion to act, as Mr. Bridge said, a writer might, with all his guilt taken away, does not have that urge to write? No, I finally have found some enjoyment in it. And I've mm -hmm. actually begun to speak louder, as perhaps you noticed. Yes, you dominate a room when you come in now. It's a... <laughs> sorry, I'm terribly sorry about that. Yes, it was a constant complaint for years that I was totally inaudible. Uh, it's the only flaw in my performance was that I could not be heard by anyone. <laughs> and this, this was a drawback, was it? It was a drawback, and it was pointed out to me gently, mm -hmm. but often. This could explain the, the 13 years in psychoanalysis. Maybe he couldn't hear you for the first 10. And, and you had to... I'm sorry, I don't mean to toy with your personal life. See, there you go, apologizing. I really don't. Again. It's my pebbles and my analysis and all that. <laughs> yes, I'll I stay I don't feel sensitive them. about those things. You, you don't? No. 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 Gee, you're funny when you do your... You know, you're, you used to do an act, and it is so funny when you stand up and do a monologue, and yet sometimes you do it, and not everyone is laughing. Were you aware of that? I noticed that myself, yes. But... <laughs> But it's so funny, and I realized what it is about it. I saw you the other night. Oh, and did about you? 24 hours later, I realized how funny that thing was that you had done. It doesn't necessarily hit you while you're doing it, but for about the, 
next two days, I've, you laugh at it. It's a great delayed action kind of comedy. What a, it's just wonderful. What a tragedy for the performer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the truth. I mean, people do laugh while you're doing it, but you only somehow see about a third of it, and then the next couple of days, you think, that was one of the funniest things I ever saw. Aww. That's yeah, that's really sweet. nice. So it's a it's a sort of a down payment of a comedy watching you do it, and then a couple of days, the next couple of days, it pays off. Mm. How can I get an analyst? Well, how can you avoid them? <laughs> that's true. I, I, that's the hard thing. I always feel at about the end of a week of, of this job that I'm just about ready. But maybe doing this sort of job talks away what I would do there, since I use this to reveal my most intimate secrets. Yes, you, uh, <coughs> you are quite frank about things. I, I believe that an analysis or psychiatry is looked upon as sort of an odd American sport uh, on your side of the Atlantic. Is that not true? Uh, yes, on the, on the whole it is, but uh, we're becoming Americanized. So, you know, in so many, in so many spheres that, uh, well, there's quite a flourishing trade in analysis going on in oh, England. Yeah. But I think it's, uh, you know, kind of cachet, uh, sign of uh, having made it. If you can afford an, an analyst, you, you've made it. You're there, you're there at the top. You see. I see. You're rich enough to be sick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to knock psychoanalysis because it has helped in a lot, a lot of people. On the other hand, you, there is something to the complaint that a lot of people who go into it because they are boorish and... And, and bad company, uh, after a couple of years of analysis, have adjusted to the fact that they're boorish and bad company, and, and they just do it without any uh, guilt whatsoever. H have your friends found you better company in any sense? Uh... Let's see. Some have found me worse, and mm -hmm. some have found me better. In other words, a little of each. A little of each. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> We have to, uh, here's a friendly word. Oh, nothing in there. Here's a friendly word from <laughs> Maud Frickert with a whole new bag. Wally, when you were a kid, did big guys pick on you? Well, uh, uh, guys of any size picked on me. Yeah. I was convinced that, that I couldn't win, you see, because I spoke good English. And they thought that was uh, made you a sissy. That's a sign of that. Yes, that. That. Mm. And uh, I never got glasses until I was 16. Therefore, I could not see the ball coming towards me. <laughs> and and uh, we would play baseball, and it would be my job to catch a high fly. Mm -hmm. And I would, I could uh, see a blur in the sky, there. And then there'd be this terrible moment while the blur approached me. And then all of a sudden, great pain would <laughs> happen to me. Uh -huh. Great pain to fingers and head and things oh like my. that. And they, or if I were at bat, they would throw the ball at me and I would see the blur and swing mm. at it and get hit in the knee. <laughs> and so I was a scared of the ball. So yeah. I, I accepted the judgment that I was a scaredy cat. But you had no way of knowing that other kids could see better than you could then, probably. If you, if you have bad vision, yes. which I've never had, luckily, I guess I, you, you wouldn't know. I heard somebody say once, I think it was Charles Nelson Riley, who said not until he was something like 11 years old did he realize that you were supposed to be able to see the wall from, from your, or the dresser in your bedroom from your bed yeah. until he found out that his okay. vision was okay. so bad. Yeah, and it, you know, it affected his whole life. I can't see either. I never knew that. You don't know that people I didn't can know see. That. No, I didn't know that. You Dressers still can't see the can't, wall. No. no, no, I can't see the wall. I never could. Well, well uh, and why don't you wear glasses then? <coughs> I've lost them. <laughs> it's good I, uh, I, uh, I knew I couldn't see very well. I had to sit in the front row to, to see the blackboard, mm -hmm. do a lot of squinting, but uh, I learned to cheat on the eye tests. <laughs> see, we oh, wait a minute. You cheated on the eye test, yes, Mr. Yes, Cox? sir, I cheated on the eye test because I did not want the stigma of uh, the four, four eyes, as we say in America. Uh -huh. And uh, in addition to what was already so obviously defective about me as far as <laughs> masculinity was concerned. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I, uh, I would hear the kids read the eye chart and after about 10 of them had done it, I had it committed to memory. 
<laughs> and would stand in the back of the room and recite it just as they had, and therefore never had to wear glasses. Did the fact that you were facing the wrong wall uh, give you away at any <laughs> point? <laughs> no, they always aimed me right. Do you know I did that once? I memorized. I wanted to show off, and I memorized the bottom two lines of an eye chart in junior high school, and I can still remember them. They were Oapen Zolot and Devtak Palahuf. <laughs> and I don't know why, the mind forgets things that are important to it, and I remember the two lines of an eye chart that is now somewhere moldering away in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's Albanian, I think. Oapen Zolot is, I it's think. Albanian, uh, yeah. Oh, I wonder, isn't that a strange thing? Hmm. Mm. Well, yeah. when you got your glasses, then were you more able to catch a ball and were you more accepted among the, the guys? Yes, I became, an, I became an instant regular feller. Just for As I got into high school, I became a regular feller. Was no longer <laughs> yeah. treated like that. Yeah. Would you, you, I never was in a fight in my whole life. I was so convinced I would just be terribly injured Mm -hmm. without any possible hope of doing injury to the other fellow. Mm -hmm. that, uh, this didn't lead you to self-defensive uh, measures like studying judo or jiu-jitsu or karate <laughs> or never, sumo wrestling or any of those things? I never heard of that stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I took to, to comedy and making a fool of myself. That's, as to, that's uh, the story so many comedians say. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But now my entire body is a weapon. <laughs> it in case, in case you were thinking of starting, a, uh, starting anything. You really, you need a license to carry your entire body. <laughs> but you haven't, you haven't been in fisticuffs. You've never. No, if, no, no. if a guy would start poking you and say, "Ah, hey, Cox, come on," yeah, like, uh, like they used to do me. What, what, what would your reaction be? Did you try to verbally outsmart them? Oh no, 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 something, something surprising physical would happen to them. When they least expected I hate to it? give this secret out, and I don't mean to challenge anyone. Uh -huh. Please uh, don't, don't let's let it happen, because something terrible will happen <laughs> to the other person. Some awful thing some happens awful to a person thing. who picks some, on you. Some, uh, some marvelous piece of, uh, of uh, engineering would suddenly occur to me. Mm -hmm. That is ominous. Could you give a slight example of it? Or do, does I don't, it involve not, pins and little wax dolls or anything? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't think I could give any examples. I hope never to give any examples. I'm against physical violence of any kind. I think it's, it's a sign that, uh, that the words have run out somehow, and not mm -hmm. only that, the other party's not even going to make the effort to search for them anymore. Yes. I always find it also that it's a sign that the other person is bigger than I am. And that uh, physical violence. No, it's violence. a sign that he thinks he's bigger than you are. I'll accept that, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, usually, I usually agree with him. Hmm. We must take a message. We will be right back. Don't threaten him, whatever you do. He's <laughs> the most entertaining gentleman who claims to be from Texas. Uh, the clues, the way he speaks and the way he dresses might lead you to think that he is. Uh, he's here to uh, sing and also uh, tell us a few stories. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Jimmy Dean? Oh, yes, there you go. Sorry, sorry. He didn't miss it? No, he didn't. Yes, sir. But I told him I was going to do it. I said, Bob, well, I, I don't couldn't care. tell if you were. No, no, I was I couldn't tell if you were kidding. I said, there. I don't care how well you started. I'm going to make out like you missed it and started over because he's a dear friend. Well, I thought you were a the lousy kid. drummer, but a very nice guy. Sing, sing, Jim. It's Shut up, Bob! It's the human qualities that Could I count. say it's a delight to be back with you? You certainly can, if it doesn't take mm -hmm. too long. That's it, right That's there. It. I take compliments very badly. Well, I noticed, yes. Yeah. And, of course, my friend over here, and we do that other show on the other network together once in a while, and he's probably one of the... The funny... Hollywood Squares. Oh, I can say that, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. We just finished a week of that. But yeah. I can take compliments swell. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 I, and I will tell you, I'll tell you this much, if I could think of one, I'd give it to you. Hey, do you have a joke? Last time you were here, you told a joke. And, yeah, um... I, I, listen, I, I usually got some old corny. This is the worst joke that I know. And, and I told oh, it in I, Vegas. I, I, I just finished in Vegas, and nobody laughed, <laughs> and they won't laugh tonight. But oh, I love it. I doubt that. You wouldn't tell a bad got... joke. 
Ah, <laughs> you would be surprised how many bad stories. But a guy walked into a lumber a lumber yard and yeah. said, "I want sit down to get a four by two." And the guy said, "Do you mean a two by four? He said, uh, uh, "Just a minute, I'll ask my brother." And he goes out and comes back in a little bit. And he said, yeah, brother said a two before, dude, that's fine. And the guy said, well, wonderful. Uh, how long do you want it? He said, a pretty good while we're building a barn. <laughs> how, how long do you want it? A pretty good while we're building a barn. I, I knew nobody had left, but I... I but just thought I'd know. lay it out. Everything has been so cultural thus far. You know, I just thought I'd throw mm -hmm. a little old country fried manure on everything, and I did. And, and that's the way it was. Would you, how much would you take to tell that joke on the Tonight I Show? I would uh, not tell that story again if it hair lipped the whole county, I'll tell you. Down on your knees, you should get an apology <laughs> for that. Isn't that terrible? Are you, you going to be in a James Bond movie? Yeah. What yeah. are you going to do, tell him jokes till he talks, or how are you going <laughs> to... I'm going to... Sorry, I won't get in there. See, that's uh, the advantage of having your own show and a writer. Uh, oh, I didn't have oh, anything oh, written, oh. you see. Yeah, I'm going to do a I, James Bond movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a moment. We, we, this is the other advantage. You we have, have a message. A and we'll be right. Oh, yeah, we have two. You see, there was we'll be a right two back. before. No. And it this long, you see. And the guys had a good little. Oh, I remember, I remember. Oh, yeah. here we are. Hi. We're talking about an old theater we both worked in, which was really a dump. Torn down. Mm -hmm. It isn't torn down, it looks torn down. It's still there. <laughs> it, well, are you kidding? I don't Look. tell me it was torn down when I got there and they haven't changed it, I know. Yes, oh, oh yeah. boy. Terrible. The, the acoustics were so bad that you yeah. could get the joke coming back at you and hear The following it. week you could get it. Yeah. Oh, we? Yeah. 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 What's this about you and pigs? <laughs> Well, you can ask the boys in the band. <laughs> I worked with a lot of them. No, so no I'm, I'm a, a hog farmer and have You been. are? Yeah. We raise now, next year we'll be raising about, oh, anywhere from 46 to 50,000 hogs a year. And uh, I'm a sausage manufacturer. Yeah. I have the largest exclusively sausage producing plant in the United States. Last week we sold, I believe, 390,000 pounds of sausage. Huh? What do you charge for 390,000 pounds of sausage? Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd rather, I, listen, I didn't come here to be made light of, Wally. <laughs> I don't what? know, you figure it out. That's did, 66 cents a pound at 390,000 pounds. Did, did you come here to be made heavy out of? Somebody got to you before you got here, didn't they? Yeah. You're getting a little chubby, Wally. I did, no, I didn't mean to put you down. No, no. this is just the look of <laughs> affluence. <laughs> <laughs> May I never be affluent, I will tell you for sure. No, I I never saw right. a man applaud statistics before, though. When someone says 360,000 pounds of sausage... You can start you... people... 390,000. 90,000, I'm sorry. I dropped yeah. a few pigs yes, there. Yes, please. You sure did, sir. What, yeah. uh, how does a man combine singing and, and sausage? Um, well, uh, you, you does just the one heard... one get in the way of the other? You just heard me sing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't think for a minute I would trust that for a living, do you? Huh? Are you kidding? You, you, you must... Country music is one of the biggest uh, things in the... No, it's, it's been very good to me, but I think basically anybody in entertainment is a little bit insecure, and That's true. Uh, you... Uh, I disagree. <laughs> You would, Wally. I, I figured you would. You're probably as secure as anybody I know, really. Of course, he's not playing with. A, <laughs> you're not playing with a full deck either. <laughs> you know that makes a great deal of difference. You know. What do you mean by that? All your bread is not quite done, Wally. Is what I'm trying to tell you. It means part of your duck is not in the oven. <laughs> I don't know. I wish I'd I don't have know said what that. Yeah. yeah. What did you say? You disagreed, though. You said... Are you, are you basically a very secure person? Is anybody totally secure? In show business especially. No. It's, it's a very... You know, there's nothing no. as fickle as the public. I wish, I, wish I had pigs to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say something right there, but I will not. <laughs> I will not in lieu of this place becoming a bowling alley tomorrow. I, yeah. I hate to think what, what runs through your head. <laughs> 
Say, why don't you live in Texas if you're a Texan? Texans yeah. hate to leave Texas. Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> Well, you, you really have cut me up, Wally, and I like you, and, and you know, and I don't want to become nasty and talk about your clothes and your appearance and why don't you go back to California and all that. Why don't yeah. I live in Texas? Yeah, why? Do you know where Plainview, Texas is? Sure. <laughs> May I oh, explain the... to the other people where it is, Wally? The tension here is so great, Let's I can't see. bear it. This clash Wayne I'm Wayne so... Texas is probably, uh, no, probably, it is the only place in the world you can stand in mud up to your fanny and dust blow in your eyes. <laughs> well, I'd certainly like to and, see that. Well, it is there, and more can blow in through a keyhole and you can shovel out a window. It's a very dusty, flat part of the country, yeah. and I like it but I wouldn't care to live there, you know, it's... <laughs> but it's where you were born and bred, Born and raised in the plains of Texas, and mm -hmm. still at dusk when the wind dies down, it's a marvelous place, and there's a great tranquility and a great freedom there on the plains, because you, they're just miles and miles of nothing but miles and miles there, you see. So, so your background is... Don't a... comment, Wally, just sit there and shut up, all right? Did, did I look pregnant with speech? Yes, you... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we want to deal in appearances here. I love you, Lolly. Mm. You're too much. I'm trying to get along. Yeah, you did very well. All right. Did, uh, where uh, were where we? Where were we? I forgot. We were in no. Plainview, Texas. <laughs> and mud up to our fanny with dust blowing in our eyes. Right. Right. Mm. I was just trying to establish that you are real, that your name isn't Kowalski and that you're from the Bronx something and that you actually pass yourself off as no. a country western star, as some do. I mean, some no. are. No, no, my name is really uh, Jimmy Cox. <laughs> Uh, no, I, my no, name is Jimmy Dean. It's Jimmy Dean. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to wear glasses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then I started playing baseball and quit. <laughs> or what something to that effect. Because of the pain when the glove hit the thing with the fuzz in the middle of the rock. Can I ask you sincerely, yes. uh, seriously though? Yes, I wish you would. W was yours a, a, a deprived childhood? A po Shut up, Wally. <laughs> Poverty stricken? Uh, yes. Was it really? Yeah, really, you yeah. know, yeah. Well. Can't you tell? <laughs> Wally, how much would you charge to haunt a house? <laughs> Just run out and play in the traffic for a while. I'm trying to carry on a decent so we... conversation with this man and you're botching it up fiercely. I'm just trying to help. Well, you're not, Wally. <laughs> As he, the hen said to the egg, you may be breakfast to somebody, but you're a pain to me, is what it turned out. I, and I would have finished that, but I like you, Dick. That's all right. I, I, I love country wisdom. <laughs> so far, that will be... I, he's confused. Say, now, listen, you're always yeah. trying to pass yourself off as, as a rustic, but I happen to know that you, you uh, were a brilliant student in school and all sorts of things that you've... Are carefully you hidden from the public. Me? No, I'm not. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've flunked everything but recess. No, now there you go. See? No, I'm telling you, I'm, you know, I'm not. I, I was a terrible student, a lousy student. Well, why would you have told me just the opposite backstage? <laughs> I didn't tell you anything backstage. What did I say to you backstage that made you think that I was a brilliant student? I'm about to be the recipient of a slam that'll tear your head off. Go ahead, Dick. You're no, going to come wait. out here and have the unmitigated recess to deny this? Uh, have you two met, by the way? <laughs> I didn't say anything about being a student anywhere. You said, don't let the people out there, don't blow my image by letting them know that I was a fraternity boy and a very brilliant student in school. And, and I just and thought it'd be fun. I didn't know you'd take it so hard that I did it. Uh, uh, at the risk of offending you old college grad and educated type cats, you're a ruddy liar is what you are, right? Well, I'll, now we'll I... never know where the truth lies, no, will we? It is, you've hurt me, really. No, I, I, I didn't. I didn't. No, I was putting you on. But the last time you were here, you, you, you said, after a while, you said you had been to college and that... No. I did not complete high school, which is the, one of the saddest things in my life. Yeah? And uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people... <laughs> no, listen, wait, 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 wait. No, 
one second, could be one second. We, no, I did not finish high school, and uh, things have been rather good to me. Yeah. But for every man that didn't finish high school, I'll show you 95% of them that go to a job every day that they don't enjoy or they don't like. So I certainly wouldn't recommend that for anybody. And I say the solution to the majority of the problems that exist in this country today are created by a lack of education. So get all the schooling you can get if or, you're a... Or get all the hogs you can get. <laughs> oh, uh, I have a... I don't envy this job. Listen, we're, they'll be. Would you invite me back roads. when he's not here? <laughs> Wait till the next time message. I get him on we'll, Hollywood Squares. We'll I'm be kick right. Square off. We'll be right back after this message. We're back. This battle of the titans is only, uh, only has a few minutes ago. I'm going. astounded that he can be as brilliant as he was, as stoned as he is. It just astounds <laughs> me completely. Oh, now, now. No, I, I, don't, I doubt if Mr. Cox has any bad habits. Uh, I have no bad habits, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> he, goes to, he goes to Tennessee every year and plants flowers on Jack Daniel's grave. It's just the kindest oh, no. move that can happen. No. no. He really doesn't drink. He's a very good man. I've known him for a long time, and I'm sick about it. Do you have any vices that... Uh... Uh -oh. I don't but, think we sorry. should discuss. I, hey, uh, you know, since I saw you last, I quit smoking. That's one thing. That's good. Yeah. What'd you, what method did you use? <laughs> what method did I use? It's really a very simple method, and mm -hmm. I think anybody that uh, tries it can do it that way. Mm -hmm. My doctor looked in my mouth and says, you have leukoplakia. <laughs> and I said, Luca who? That's a real thing. Yes, it's a, it's a, and he said it's a precancerous uh, irritation that if mm -hmm. you continue to smoke, your head will rot off, and if you quit, it will get well, and everything will be fine. And under those conditions, it's the simplest thing in the world to quit. Really. It was, because people have been warned of serious things and still not been able to quit. Well, it scared the hell out of me is what it did, and I yeah. just quit, and uh, I feel great. It's just the greatest thing in the world, man. I think the past tense of quit is quiet, isn't it? <laughs> I've never well, seen you, such you a... didn't finish high school, I'm trying to help. I, you know what? I, I didn't finish high school, but I want to tell you this. About two more words out of you, and I'm going to buy this studio and throw your fanny out of it. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Might makes right, is that it? <laughs> No, I like never, it. Did you ever see him come on like this to anyone? No, I don't know he, what he's it is. usually I... the very soft and... I think it's yeah. animosity built up from his ignorance on that dang show with the squares up did, there. Did you top him once you know, on Hollywood Squares no, or something? Know. or did He you... thinks ice hockey's frozen manure. He sits up there, he doesn't answer anything correctly, you know. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> well, it's very hard to decide who's won this debate tonight. I, uh, I, I, don't, I really don't know. You invite us back sometime for a fist fight. Oh, I think you ought to be on the advocates together. I think you ought to really have a serious debate. Are, are you deep down good friends? Is it true you used to be roommates? I never heard of him. Oh, you darn. I know him well, Wonder Dog. <laughs> you're, you're, you're on, you've been on the Hollywood Squares. Yes, I've been on there twice, but never I again. Th I always thought it'd be fun. It is the greatest show yeah. due to this nut and Paul Lynn and Charlie Weaver. And it is a joy and a pleasure and a fun show to do. Now, how did they decide who goes in what box on that show? They have this. That is another question that will not be answered on this show this evening, sir. But it was a nice question. Yeah, that's really. A good question. You're, you say something to him. Say something that's to him. Question. Don't well, just Well, he and Charlie and Paul always get the same box, and we peons get whichever one they throw at us. That's the way it is decided. I'm sir. glad we cleared that up. We have a brief message from our local stations, and <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> If you had been here, Mr. Cox just picked up Mr. Dean and used him as an object. Let's be there. My heaven is Jim Hawthorne. Give me that. 
the hernia heard around the world, I would think. <laughs> Monday night, Ginger Rogers will be here. Ginger Rogers, believe it or not, Leonard Fry, Stanley Kaufman. Thank you, Anthony Burgess. Thank you, Wally Cox. Thank you, James Dean. And we will see you. Does anyone call you that ever? No. We'll see you Monday night. He got killed. Jimmy. <laughs>